Well, good morning, Good Shepherd. I am Talbot Davis. I'm the pastor here, whether you are live or live stream. So glad to be able to connect with you. It is week two of a series called Dealing with Difficult People, a series you know is only about other people. It has nothing to do with any of you here. So thank you for uh, having that patience and that understanding. Today's message is called, believe it or not, Genuine Hate. And it comes from the Bible. And in the Bible, it comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12 and verse 9. So if you have your Bible with you, maybe it looks like this, or maybe your Bible's loaded on your phone, however you have it. Locate Romans chapter 12 and just keep a finger there. And if you don't have a Bible that looks like this and it's not on your phone, the words are going to be up on the screen at just the right time because they always are. As you're locating that place in your Bible, I want to let you know about one thing that I'm uh, really glad about around here. We've had a preschool at this church for years and years and years. It does a, a phenomenal job impacting young children in the community. Starting this fall, we are adding kindergarten and first grade to that preschool as we transform it into Good Shepherd Christian Schools. And we're, yeah, because we, we just know that there are moms and dads and grandmoms and granddads out there who want another option. And we want to provide that uh, as a way of inviting more and more people into a living relationship with Jesus. Out in the lobby today, you will see representatives from Good Shepherd Christian School. And if you want more information, if you want to get your kids signed up already, you can do all of that out in the lobby at the table that's in the center of the lobby. You'll be really glad you did, you did and glad for the direction that we're taking at this church. So that was a free advertisement. We're back to this message that is called genuine hate. As I ask you to find Romans chapter 12, and verse 9, we just want you to know something that we believe about the Bible at this church, and you may not agree with it, but we like to be honest and clear about where we stand, and it's this. We believe that the biblical library, the whole thing, is inspired and eternal and true. God breathed his life and truth into it. And because we in leadership here believe that about the Bible, we have this custom that when we talk about the Bible here, we lift it up. And if you've never been here, never tuned in, and you see phones in the air and Bibles in the air, and you're just like, well, that's unusual, we admit it. It is. It's kind of strange. But we've learned this is a moment of oddity that shapes our identity as a community. We're a collection of people who don't have life figured out. But we sure know who does. And because we know he does, we're glad to surrender to his authority. Amen? And before I go anywhere else or say anything else, let's pray. God, thank you that you're a good God. Thank you for breathing life and truth into your word. And, and I ask that same Holy Spirit who inspired Paul to write to the church at Rome would inspire me, would fill me from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head with everything that's good and right and joyful about what it means to follow Jesus. And more importantly, Lord, give that same outpouring to everyone within the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are talking about dealing with difficult people in this series at Good Shepherd. And, and last Sunday, if you were with us, and if you weren't, I'm really, really glad you're here. But last Sunday, we, we introduced the series with a message called Sincere Love, which is really kind of sweet when you think about it. And now you hear that message number two in this series is called Genuine Hate. And all of a sudden, you're kind of alarmed because to go from these incredible poles of sincere love, isn't that sweet, to genuine hate, who would ever call a sermon that? You're beginning to wonder that I might be a little bit unstable, and I'm certainly the difficult person that you have to deal with. Amen? And, and you didn't have to. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, while I may be the difficult one, may or may not be the difficult one, definitely the biblical one today. Because the title of this message actually comes directly from the words of Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. Look at what it says. Love must be sincere is how the verse began last week. Then Paul continues, hate what is evil 
cling to what is good. Hate what is evil. And I just am so fascinated with that commandment because Paul is, is here, he's talking to a church in the ancient city of Rome, and that church is filled with people who are difficult to get along with, and Paul devotes this whole section of the letter saying in so many words, just get along better, will you? And apparently, he thinks that hating what is evil is a vital part, not only of dealing with difficult people, getting along with them, but not being so difficult yourself. And the reason that that I think that's just a really interesting command is because while it might look fairly clear on paper, hate what is evil, I know for a fact that that is one of those commands that is so difficult, almost impossible to obey. Because the reality is that most of us don't hate evil, at least the evil that we find in ourselves or that we find ourselves in, we don't really hate it. Usually we sort of want to tolerate it or get along with it, or maybe we just want to snack on it uh, just a little bit. Yeah, gluten-free, by the way, don't worry. And, but beyond that, and I'm going to come back to that in just a moment, what, what we really want to do with the evil that we find in ourselves or ourselves in. But the, kind of the preliminary truth The opening act really is this way of making people understand, making all of us understand that while none of us hate evil, really, we all hate its consequences. Catch that difference? We we don't really usually hate what's evil. We hate the consequences of that evil. Like those commissioners, county commissioners out in California, this is a couple of months ago, and, and, and they got caught on tape uttering the worst kind of slurs about a child of one of their fellow commissioners. And as happens in the year 2023, those slurs, which got recorded, and what do you do with recordings in 2023? You put them on the internet so that the whole world can hear. Well, the commissioners who got in all kinds of trouble for what they had said, they didn't really hate their slurs. They hate that it got it recorded and that it got caught. Yeah, that, we hate evil's consequences way more than we hate evil itself. Or, or I, don't, I don't know exactly who, but I suspect that some of you, e- either live stream or live, some of you at some point in your past, you went to a Christmas party at work and you had a little bit too much to drink and you got arrested on the way home and you had to spend a night in a jail with a DUI. And, and you didn't really, you didn't, you didn't hate the Christmas party. Maybe you hated the Christmas party. But you didn't really hate the getting tipsy part. What you hated was getting caught. You wanted to dodge the bullet and make it home okay, but instead that officer had his radar gun or he noticed it swerving or whatever, and you hated that night that you spent in jail. We don't hate evil, we, but we do hate the consequences of it. Or, or maybe the husband, I don't know if this happened in your life, maybe the husband been catting around for years, for a long time and promises to do better, and promises to stay faithful, and doesn't keep those promises, and come home, comes home one day, and the house is evacuated, and the papers are served. And the husband asks, well, what have you done to his wife? And she says, it's not what I've done, it's what you've been doing. And he didn't hate the cat in the round. He hated getting caught. Hated coming home to an evacuated house. We don't really hate the evil that we find in ourselves or we find ourselves in. We hate its consequences. So having cleared all of that up, we, we, we can now dig back into what it is that Paul says, because remember, he's writing to a church in Rome, and, and the church is having all kinds of trouble getting along with each other, and, and somehow he finds it necessary to tell them, hate what is evil. Don't hate who is evil, but hate what is evil. And that brings up a whole nother question. Who decides what's evil? If Paul says, hate what is evil, well, who makes the decision about what it, does the Taliban, do they decide what's evil? 
does that politician you hate, and anytime they say something, well, that's evil. Does the celebrity you despise, and every time they tweet something out, well, that's evil. Does this fashion faux pas that shows up, <laughs> and, and, and you look at it, well, that's e Now, we can all agree on that. That is evil and wicked. So who, <laughs> I hope nobody came into church today in shorts and long socks and <laughs> sandals. So who decides what's evil? Now, if you can take the photo, you're going to keep that up the whole time, aren't you? you if, if, uh, it, it, you may not be a person of faith and, and that's okay. But if you're not a person of faith, you're going to disagree with what I'm getting ready to say. And I just want, I just want to be clear about that. But in, in leadership here, we believe that there is a way to determine what is evil because God has already determined it. We believe that, that God has given us an objective record of what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is evil. And we believe that we find that record not in the Quran. That's why the Taliban doesn't decide for us what's evil. We believe it is in the words of inspired scripture. And, and, and in the words of inspired scripture, we do have this record uh, of what's evil. And that's why, that's why we can look at scripture and we can say that having a glass of wine with dinner is not evil because Jesus did that. And if Jesus did something evil, we got a whole nother set of problems we have to deal with. Yet not stopping at the one, but having the whole bottle and getting drunk, that is evil because the word is very clear. And the, the word is clear on, on the obvious evil like murder and, and adultery. And then the inconvenient ones like greed and gossip. And you're like, gossip? We're not supposed to gossip, but it's so delicious. No, gossip is in there. It's part of the evil. And, and so, yeah, we, we believe that there is this objective standard and it's always for our good. It's always as our privilege. It's never as our punishment, but God has decided and God has declared what is evil and what is good, which brings us back to Paul and we've realized together already, yeah, we don't really hate the evil in ourselves or that we find ourselves in. We, we do hate its consequences. But something, something much more insidious is going on when it comes to us and evil. Something that helps you realize that, that, that Paul says, hate what is evil, not hate who is evil. And this really insidious thing that goes on with us and with evil that we don't really hate it, we, we do sort of, I got my gluten-free crackers here. We snack on it. That was good. <laughs> we coexist with it. We think just a, just a little snack of it won't hurt us a bit. It's like guys, guys, when you're channel surfing, and something comes on your TV screen that shouldn't ought to be on your TV screen. You're like, whoa, where did that come from? Well, it's on your TV. Where did that come from? And that shouldn't be on my screen. And so you go back and well, but I need to find out exactly who that was and exactly what she's about. So I can know how upset I am that it's on my TV screen. It's snacking or web surfing. It's not channel surfing, it's web surfing. And you go to a website and you go, whoa, how'd that get on my computer screen? Well, because you went there. <laughs> and you're like, well, I should not be on that web page, but I do need to find out her name and maybe I'll send her a message. It's snacking. Or ladies, or social media. Maybe that's not your particular temptation or maybe it is. But in the era of social media and Facebook and you think back, your, your, your husband's not really making you especially happy and, and you just got a lot of issues in marriage. And you remember that guy that you went out with in high school and woo, I'm that high school graduation class Facebook page. Maybe I can reach out to him and maybe he can tell me why it is that my husband is so difficult to deal with. Nothing, nothing will come from it. Or, or maybe you've been on the receiving end of some infidelity, 
receiving end of some abuse. And the stakes are too high. Can't really take a stand. It's just a little snacking with evil. It's just a little coexisting with evil. Or maybe it's at work. And there's that guy at work. And he has that funny accent. And you don't know exactly where he's from. But the accent lets you know that he ain't from around here. And you send your coworkers texts making fun of that guy for his accent. And you're kind of tired of all the diversity training at work anyway. And, and so you send those texts and it makes your coworkers laugh. And it's, what is it? It's just a little bit of snacking. Just a, speaking of texts, woo. You get that text from her and there's such a buzz. Or you get that text from him and your whole face lights up. There's something so, so personal and so electric about a text message. Nothing's going to come from it. It's not like you want your mate to see them, but nothing's going to come from it. It's snacking. And we do it. And we do it. And we do it. Naively convinced that nothing ill is going to hap happen from it. That's what we do with the evil we find ourselves in and that we find in ourselves. We coexist with our sin. We snack on our sin and we go about our merry little way convinced that nothing will ever happen from all of it. And to let you know how ridiculous that approach is, how foolish that approach is, what would it be like? I mean, the, the best comparison, what would it be like those of you who are homeowners and your home has some wood in it to be like all of you who have a home and you find out that there are termites in your home? Well, what would you say? Ah, it's just a small colony of termites. We just got to coexist with it for a little bit. Let's not make such a big deal of these termites in our house. And that problem will take care of itself. Well, you do that, you moron. And pretty soon, <laughs> pretty soon, the termites that you have allowed to have just a little snack on your, on your timber and on your studs and on, on your, the arches, they will begin to feast on you. And there goes all your hard-earned equity down the termite digestive system. That's what it's like. That's how foolish it is to think that you can coexist with the sin, that you can snack on it and it won't turn into anything worse. Or maybe it's like what happens when you go to a restaurant and, you know, you ask for a glass of water at the restaurant and then they always say, well, would you like lemon with that? And you go, no, I don't, I don't want any lemon, but could you, could you put a, a teaspoonful of raw sewage in with the water? It's just a little. It's just a little discoloration. It's exactly what it's like. Maybe it's like that, that guy that I had a conversation with. This is 25, 26 years ago, another church, another town. And, and we were talking about some, some compulsive sort of unhealthy behaviors that he had. And, and as he kind of got to the end of the conversation that we were talking about, he goes, well, about, about his behaviors. And, and he goes, well, I, I can live with it, though. And in response, and remember, I was way younger and much less filtered. And after he, he said, well, I can live with it. And I said, well, can you die with it? Again, I was way younger, much less, but can you, can you die defined by that sin? And he never really answered that question. And we ended up going our separate ways. But the amazing thing is I found out in the last couple of months that that guy who's my age died like in his fifties, late fifties. And I don't know if he ever ceased being defined by that sin, if he ever stopped snacking and started turning his life over. I, I, I don't know. What I do know is that whole concept of we are going to snack on our sin just a little bit at a time. We are so incredibly naive thinking that it won't turn into anything worse. And this is why Paul, the same Paul, pastor, author, missionary, genius. That's why he tells the church at Rome, Romans, 
You can't get along with difficult people. You can't not be a difficult person yourself unless you begin to hate not someone, but something. And it comes with this realization, this sort of pivotal, almost haunting realization. And here's what I want you to know, Good Shepherd. The sin that you snack on becomes the evil that feasts on you. The sin that you snack on, the little bit of gluten-free cracker of sin that you just snack a little bit of time, it turns around and it grows and it becomes the evil that feasts on you. That which you think you can coexist, it conquers you. It devours you. What you tolerate today will turn around and dominate you tomorrow. And, and so with that reality and with that understanding and, and our awareness that we're trying to deal with difficult people, we're not trying to, and we're trying not to be a difficult people, a person, wouldn't it be a great day, great reality, if today was the day at Good Shepherd Church that the snacking stopped? That God, by God's power, through God's grace, through the truth of God's word, we'd stop the snacking that slowly but surely is going to turn around and feast on us. And today is the day that the snapping, snacking shop stops. Because parents, moms and dads, you need this with your kids. So often it can be tempting just to punt, just to sort of, give in. There's nothing I can do. This culture is so powerful. I really see this in, in parents of teenagers, and, and, and I've heard this a lot through the years, where parents of teenagers, they just assume that teenage rebellion is inevitable. Well, they're going to hate me, and they're going to begin to hate Jesus, and they're going to run off from the faith. No, it is not inevitable. It does not have to happen. And moms and dads, regardless of the age of your children, either you can disciple your kids or TikTok will. The choice is yours. And the results of letting TikTok do it will never be pretty. The sin you snack on becomes the evil that feasts on you. And singles, you need this. Because those of you who are single and are single again, the the wild oats you sow grow up as poison. And the poison that grows up from the wild oats you sow, sometimes it, it grows up when, in your marriage, you're, you're single now, sowing wild oats, and then you get married five years, 10 years, and woo, there's all that poison in your marriage, and it's all the result of the oats that you done sowed when you were single. And for some of you who, who are single now and sowing oats, it, 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 it will, the, the poison won't so much bloom in your, marri in your marriage, but it's the reason why you have such a hard time having healthy relationships now. And we, we say this a lot at Good Shepherd, but we really want people to be emotionally healthy before they ever get married in the first place. Because when, I don't know if you know this or not, but if you're in a marriage and you got issues, you're like, dang. I didn't have any issues till I got married. Yeah, you did. You brought all kinds of issues into your marriage and your mate brought issues into the marriage and all of a sudden you get married and you got issue collision. And that's why we want people who are single now to become as emotionally healthy as they possibly can. And for some of you, that's going to require therapy. For some of you, that will require a 12-step meeting. For all of you, it will require growing in the knowledge of the word. Because again, for single people, the sin that you snack on, and you're like, I'm, I'm not attached. You're attached to the Lord. The sin you snack on becomes the evil that feasts on you. And married, because you've been, whew, I'm so glad he's not talking to me. He's been talking to singles and singles again and moms and dads. He ain't not talking to me. Married, I'm talking to you. And here's what I want you to know. Does your mate have your passwords? Does your spouse have the codes to your online life or to your mobile device? 
I, I, I want to be as, as bold to say that you cannot have a beautiful marriage, and we are all about the beautiful marriage movement at this church. You cannot have a beautiful marriage unless you have free and open access into one another's online life, unless you share those passwords, unless you share those passcodes, because you are only as sick as your secrets. And I have to believe there's a lot of sick marriages within the sound of my voice because, oh, that's my property. That's my stuff. No, it's not. The, the whole idea of my stuff and my property, that end of the day you said I do. You. You. The sin you snack on will become the evil that feasts on you. Do you know this? How Romans chapter 12, verse 9 ended, hate what is evil, and now you know why. You're not hating who is evil, you're hating what is evil. It ends with cling to what is good, cling to what is good. And, and we have this conviction born of Romans chapter 12, verse 9, that you, but you can only replace bad habits, and whether those bad habits have to do with web surfing or channel surfing or weekend drinking that you can only replace those bad habits when get rid of those bad habits when you replace them with something good. And when Paul says cling to what is good, it always makes me think of those glorious words of Psalm 37, verse four. We're gonna throw that up on the screen. It says this, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Take delight in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. And a lot of times we wanna be given the desires of our heart we forget what happens first. Ah, delight in the Lord. And, and I believe that God has brought you here today so that you might hear the good news that you have this privilege, you have this opportunity of having the deepest delight in your life be the fact that you have been chased and you have been caught and you're being kept by a savior who was working on you a long time before you were ever looking for him. That the best thing about your life that you can wake up with, with a grin on your face, face is the fact that you are bought, you're bought with the precious blood and you don't accept that grudgingly, you accept it gleefully and joyfully. That's the best thing about your life. And do you want to know, do you want to know what is so good about taking delight in the Lord rather than snacking on sin? No secrets. You don't have to keep it hidden from anybody. You can let everybody know because you're only as sick as your secrets. <laughs> we want you well. Indeed, we have a tool here, a practical tool at this church. Every morning, there's, there's over 1,800 people in this church and all around the country who, who are part of a ministry that we call Come Alive Daily. And you can sign up, like right now, you can pull out your phone and sign up. You go to gscharlotte.org slash email and you scroll down to Come Alive Daily. And if you sign up, like right now, Tomorrow at 4 a.m., and I can promise you it will be there at 4 a.m. tomorrow because it's already written and already scheduled. You will have in your email inbox an introduction. We're starting a brand new letter from the New Testament tomorrow, the letter of 1 Peter. And you can get on the ground floor, well, along with 1,800 other people who've been doing it a little while, you can get in on the ground floor of 1 Peter because we've realized that instead of shaking people by the shoulders, read the Bible more. How much better to come alongside them, put an arm around their shoulder. We'd like to help you understand what it is that you're reading in the Bible. You do that. You sign up. So the first thing you do in the morning is not get enveloped in the world, but get saturated in the word. And you'll be a long way towards stopping the snacking and embracing the king. So, Father, thank you that you are a good God. Thank you that you, that every no in your word is laced with love. It's always for our good. And I pray that you would fill the people of Good Shepherd with the delight in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.